The following is a class given by His Holiness Jaya Pataka Swami Maharaj recorded on September 17th, 1979 in Los Angeles, California. The class is part two. Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sunnavadi Pasatya Deshitarine Today we heard how Siddha Prabhupada was personally preaching to the public, to the neophyte guests, trying to bring them to the platform of surrendering to Krishna. That time, nobody had any understanding how to see Srila Prabhupada, how to deal, what is the meaning of spiritual master. In those days, the devotees, or what, I don't know what you can call them, the guests who were aspiring to be devotees, they would listen to Srila Prabhupada's lecture, walk outside and smoke a cigarette. They didn't know that that wasn't all right. And Srila Prabhupada would personally cut the vegetables, cook the prasadam, feed them. Then he'd go back and wash all the dishes. It took many months, even years, before the people could understand were coming there, even they thought that they were great yogis by hearing Prabhupada's lessons. They had not the slightest idea what was Siddha Prabhupada's position, what was their responsibility. One day Siddha Prabhupada was sitting on his Vyasasana. <clears throat> and he asked so whether they knew what is the position of spiritual master. What is the meaning of initiation into spiritual life? Of course, everybody was very interested. They were amazed. They were uh, enthralled. What is this diksha? What is initiation? What is this spiritual entrance? They are very curious to find out. In fact, one person asked, what is the meaning of this initiation? And then Siddha Prabhupada, looking at them, he changed his mannerism and he simply told them that initiation means to accept the spiritual master as you would accept God himself. To do whatever he says. And he got up and walked out. left them to think about that one. Maybe you explained, you want 
To know what is initiation, it means no more free will. Whatever the spiritual master says that you do. That is initiation. The spiritual master is the Swarup of Krishna. He is the representative of God. One respects him just as one would respect had God himself come personally present. Prabhupada taught the girls how to wear saris, taught the boys how to wear dhotis. What didn't he teach? How to cook prasad, how to worship deity. Spoon feeding the babies. Who had that kind of patience to come, great gentlemen and aristocratic people from India to come and the previous people came over, they only wanted to deal with the aristocrats. But when they approached the aristocrats, they said, give up meat, give up drinking, give up intoxication, I'll die. It's not possible to live without these things. This was the reply they got in Europe and England. Prabhupada, for months, for over a year, simply, very patiently, how perseveringly, day by day, week by month, this coaxing along, preaching, gradually trying to bring these souls into the fold of Krishna. That type of patience and perseverance is so austere to get the chance for a big push is so ecstatic to be able to just run, to be able to jump, to be able to go at full pace. But when we consider how Prabhupada was simply taking practically no advancement, simply if someone came to hear about Krishna, he was happy. Somehow trying to bring them to the standard. Trying to get them to give up meat, to get them to give up intoxication, gambling. Then seeing the situation, giving them spiritual marriage. There's no sannyasi in history who ever gave marriage that we know of. But in America, if people get married, it's a great advancement over what goes on ordinarily. So he had to teach them what is the meaning of marriage. Nobody even knew what is the Vedic meaning of marriage. Still, many may not have realized the obligation. So, that kind of patience coupled with a tremendous drive I think at the point of that patience, we would have crushed. Years and years together, how many years? Two, over a year, year and a half, two years struggling with hardly any sign of. We would have said that the city is fried. Better try someplace else. After a year, they're, they're still not even giving up smoking. So Prabhupada was so pleased when he saw so many devotees fixed up in Krishna consciousness. Once there was the example, once he had some devotees strong in Krishna consciousness, then from there other people could see, oh, this is how I should be. This is how I should act. 
Here is the spiritual master, here is disciples. All the disciples are working so hard, they're distributing books, they're preaching. You see, that made it so much easier. Before Prabhupada had to give association, be the spiritual, had to be everything, all in one. So then when so many uh, disciples were here in the Western world preaching so nicely, uh, then Prabhupada, he didn't have to uh, give so many criticisms here in the West. He would simply encourage. Sometimes he would become very angry and say, you must increase book distribution. If you don't increase book distribution, then I will no longer translate. Then I won't stay here. He would push to get out the book. In India he would come and uh, he said that, please build my residence during the life of the resident. But we were so uh, incapable that we could not achieve. So many changes of design, so many architectural this and that. Ultimately, we could not even provide him a residence during his uh, residence. So, in India, Prabhupada used to come and simply yell at us. I didn't know how he, I heard that he didn't yell so much in the end here, because I guess everyone's service was so wonderful, he was appreciating. But we could expect him when he came to Mayapur that for the first day he would say all kind of nice things. He would smile. And then we were waiting. <laughs> what thing would tick off? What thing would initiate the severe criticism which would extend for the next two months or one month of his stay without cessation? He'd be walking around and he'd go into the kitchen and the kitchen had been scrubbed spotless. On the step there was some cement had fallen from pl plastering. So it appeared to be like a piece of dirt, but actually it was the cement on top of the colored cement. Prabhupada was walking, suddenly he was spotted. What is that dirt? You cannot see, are you blind? This is like washing the coal. Wash, wash, always more black. You are still not cleaning. Although I'm standing here, immediately you start to cement. It doesn't come off. <laughs> just see, just see. <laughs> the sweepings of the sugarcane spittings had been swept right by the boga sugarcane. Prabhupada, he called the Indian and said that we're standing by. And he said, well, I have, you have simply come here to go to hell. You are born in this country, you don't know any better. You are taking these spittings and sweeping them right by the unoffered, uncrushed sugar cane. And this will be crushed and given to Krishna. You are simply coming to the ashram to go to hell. Then some Grihastha devotee, there was some little two-year-old kid going by with a sugar cane. Immediately he goes and starts to grab the sugar cane from the kid. Then Prabhupada said, oh, now you have become the coach. Now you have become the expert. I am yelling at you, now you are going and grabbing the candy from the baby. Simply rascal them. <laughs> Wherever he went, heads would simply. <laughs> I know Jai Maharaj, he had uh, just arrived 
that morning, about three hours earlier, he was going on the morning walk, and there was about 50 guests. So Prabhupada decided just to go over. We had a circular outhouse type of latrine arrangement. And he took his, uh, maybe he wanted to pasture, maybe he just wanted to see, he took his cane, hit open one door. There someone had not washed or flushed the toilet. Immediately he turned to Jai Tears and said, Look it! Look at this! And you call yourself a Brahmin! Where there is Brahmin, everything must be goodness. There must be cleanliness. You are present, you call yourself a Brahmin, and how this is going on? In the presence of Brahmin, how this dirtiness can go on? Jai Tirtha said, <laughs> there was no one who was spared. So we saw different moods. So Prabhupada, I never realized because I was so stupid that actually he was teaching us as Rameshwar Swami pointed out. He was teaching us that he wanted the highest standard to be maintained unless we really cared about it, unless we were really involved in it in a deep emotional way, in a deep conscious way. It wouldn't happen. You didn't press the point. No one would take it seriously. The Prabhupada pressed it I remember sometimes Prabhupada, he would there were so many GBCs present he was giving me some very serious uh, ribbing about uh, the Gober gas plan I built because Gober gas there we had a too thin a pipe now we put a thicker pipe so actually now it works very well but that time, when he came to see, only one or two little burners, little flame came out for this huge gober gas contraption. So sometimes he would, he would say, just say, how is the gober gas working? <laughs> working all right. <laughs> Most of the other GBCs had been there for a few days. So they already realized the mood that it was, when you're in India, you had to be very, quiet because if you started to stick your head up too much you also might get it. It's best to just watch and kind of enjoy from a distance. <laughs> but there was someone who had just newly come in and as soon as he heard that he started laughing and laughing. Prabhupada just kind of looked at him like a laser beam. <laughs> and the next night the person got very sick. Prabhupada demanded that uh, we had to build the big building in, you know, like, had to be finished in two months or something. Just, he would, he would, of course, we were always amazed how in two months Los Angeles printed 17 books. That was the mood that Prabhupada used in India. That was the way I'm sure everyone can remember. We still preach to our book distributors how fired up Los Angeles DBT was, they published 17 books in two months. So that kind of mood Prabhupada would apply sometimes. That was his mercy. He always would say that I'm having a transcendental competition. I want to, especially because, you see, his God brothers didn't cooperate with him. So it was really a stake of whether they didn't really follow as correctly anyway. We cannot say, you know, because there are much senior people, but they didn't really cooperate up to Prabhupada's satisfaction. I mean, he begged them just to give him one 
guest house to keep the devotees. She probably wouldn't have built the whole Mayapur temple had they just given a, a guest house. Of course, she would have taken over all the temples. They realized that eventually because he was doing the most active preaching. But uh, that's why they didn't want they didn't want him to have any place. It was like the Kuru and Kuru Kshetra and the Pandavas. They wouldn't even give him one, as much land as you could put a pin to. So he had to purchase his own land and develop his own facility for his own disciples. So he said, I am having, of course, he had transcendental competition with his, with his uh, god brothers and he had straight out competition with the, all of the rest of Maya's representatives. But he said, I want everything done in the American way. Everything must be done in the American way. I am known as the American Guru. So you are all Americans, you must do everything not in Indian way, but in American way. You must have not a single shift, but double shift. I remember we worked day and night on one building using the lights. He wrote to the Prabhupada that now we are working 16-hour shifts. We have 600 people working. Uh, there are over a uh, caravan. It was like the pyramids. We were digging out the pukwa and the people are going up with the head loads. Over 200 people chained out one after the other carrying baskets of mud. And then there was 150 bullock carts carrying sand from the river and carrying dirt from the, uh, from the man-made lake. And then another 300 people were working on the actual construction. So we told, it was, it was something amazing to see. Actually, that was very blissful. No one everywhere in the, in the whole district or anywhere in the whole state had ever seen so many people at one time working on so many different projects. So when we wrote to Prabhupada that uh, we had started double shift, he immediately wrote back that uh, this is uh, our success. This is what I want. Working in American way. Double shift. No one has ever done this before in my airport. No one has done this. You should do everything in the American way. He would say many times. He wanted it. He didn't want us to imitate the Indians. He wanted us to do everything very fast. Of course, he criticized me that uh, after about three, four years there, he said, now I think you are becoming Bengalized, Indianized. You must do everything in the American way. Of course, his idea of American way was so transcendental. So I've just come here to to get the association and see the Rameshwar Swami so I can do everything the American way. <laughs> it satisfies the Prabhupada. He doesn't want anyone to walk. He just wants everyone to stay about a foot off the ground. That was the Prabhupada's idea. And of course, his speed, no one could match. How he would speak right up till 10 o'clock and be up at 12 or 1. Sometimes he'd ring the bell and at 1 o'clock in the morning he'd call us down. And he'd say, Why? Where have you been? I was sleeping. Why are you are sleeping? I am not sleeping now. Why are you are sleeping? Why are you are sleeping? Then he would give some idea he had been thinking about. So, of course, even at the age of 70, 75, 80, when Prabhupada went on his morning walk, he would leave half the devotees. Of course, in the end, a little bit, he slowed down for us to catch up. But he would walk so fast that the devotees would... Uh, themselves would be huffing and puffing. They could hardly keep up. 
was so energetic. And he would immediately be smashing. He'd ask me any question and he'd be smashing the scientist. One day he was on top of the Mayapur. He decided to take rest on the roof because it was a little warm downstairs. And then he was, it was like the story of, maybe you know the story of uh, Srinivasacharya where uh, his uh, the spiritual master said that, uh, what is that? And there the devotees saw, the disciples saw a rope. He said, that's a rope. He says, no, that's a snake. What's there? That's a snake. No, that's a rope. What do you see there? Oh, it's a rope. Excuse me. What do you see there? Rope. No, it's a snake. Oh, yes, it's a snake. <laughs> Whatever the spiritual master sees, said that. My own vision, I'm blind. I can't see anything. I may appear to see something, but my real vision is whatever the spiritual master is. Prabhupada was looking up at the moon and he said, Yes, you know what the moon is made out of? No, sir, it's all about Earth or something? No, it's made out of green cheese. Yes, to the profile. <laughs> Actually, he said it's made out of one big chunk of ice. So much ice. That is, otherwise, how it is so cooling? If it's not ice, how are you feeling so cool? Isn't it very cooling? Yes, to the profile. In this way, the profile would give various conceptions about what the moon was made out of. Then he said, you have ever seen an ant? Yes. So just like you are looking down upon the ants, uh, they are looking down upon you. Look at those teeny little human beings walking around. The demigods, they are so intelligent, they are so powerful, they are so far advanced that they are living so long. They're looking down upon human beings just like we look down at the ants. Oh, look at they're only living how many? Ten days. Their one, our one year is their six months. That means that our lifetime is their forty or fifty days. Oh, they live one month. Little bugs. The Prabhupada's vision was universal, was transcendental. So, his children and grandchildren, they are, of course, greatly fortunate to be in the line of this disciplic succession. And just like Sri Prabhupada untiringly preached to us, preached to his disciples and to the public, and tried to establish a new world. Actually, he has already established, it's already existing in his mind. By his intense desire, the whole world is already saved from this material contamination. Simply, we have to just carry out the order. The battle is already fought. It's just like Arjuna. He simply had to go out there with his uh, bow and arrow. Krishna had already killed everyone. Of course, in the battlefield it appeared sometimes very dangerous. It was very tense. But Arjuna actually, al although he was in the midst of that tenseness and that battle, ultimately Krishna's will was already done. He simply had to go out there and dedicate himself to the battle. So like that Prabhupada's will, the will of Lord Chaitanya has been brought down by Sri Prabhupada. Simply everyone has to carry that order to the disciplic succession. And the battle result is already fixed. It's already known. That the whole world, Pratibhiti Achei Jatunagari Gram, Sarvatri Prachar, Hoyeve Mornam. Who else 
What other Muhammad has this conception that without a doubt our system of spiritual science will be in every town and village without a doubt. Who else has that faith? Some people are storing up canned food in their basement, waiting for the persecution. People try to spread this, but no one else has implicit faith that this will spread to every single town and village and person will hear about the message of Lord Chaitanya. Because we know that this is Lord Chaitanya's desire, this is Srila Prabhupada's intense desire. Yesterday we read his prayer, how he said that simply by Bhakti Siddhanta's intense desire already, all these people are delivered. We know that by one particle of dust, the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada, whole universes are delivered. We are simply implementing. This we are allowed to feel that we are doing some service, although everything is already being done by Him. Simply if we can be instruments, surrender ourselves as His puppet, so that He can dance us as He likes, according to His sweet will. I am just feeling unfortunate that I am seeing everywhere I go how wonderfully everyone is surrendered to Srila Prabhupada, the Siplic Successions, will, dancing as he desires, while well, I am just dragging my feet. So I just pray for the mercy of Srila Ramashaya Swami and all the Vaishnavas that I, one day I may be able to dance according to Srila Prabhupada direction as wonderfully as they all are. Thank you. We see that everyone is a servant of God and this Krishna conscious movement is simply understanding we are all the servants of God. God is known as uh, by different names to different people. So we know him as Krishna, as Govinda, as uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So somebody who is converted, you see, they convert for various reasons. In India, I've seen conversions for economic reasons. I've seen conversions just because people came and uh, due to a, a basic lack, just like in uh, America, if you take a poll, how many Christians have read the Bible, you may be, find that very few have actually read it cover to cover. Similarly, in India, if you were to take a poll of the people, they may all be Hindu and worship Krishna, but if you ask how many people have actually read the Bhagavad Gita, from cover to cover, which is the main book of the Hindu, uh, the Hindu uh, dharma or religion, you'll be surprised to find that a, a small fraction have actually taken the trouble to read their own literature. This uh, basic lack of culture, of religious awakened state all over the world is not isolated to America or to India, but it's everywhere. Basically everyone is more interested in things other than God consciousness or in through self-realization today. That's why we're suffering all the things we are. So if somebody has converted and now he has changed from a Hindu and has become a Christian and then he's saying, oh yes, Hare Krishnas are bad, that, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, really bother us so much. Anybody who's allowed to have whatever opinion he has, obviously that person has uh, not taken that. We don't say Christians are bad. We don't say that anybody bad that is uh, really sincerely following God. So obviously he hasn't understood what is the uh, what is the Bhagavad Gita and what is this Krishna conscious movement all about. He's simply taking on what he's heard from some person who has fed him some misinformation. Our doors are open and if he came in and discussed it, you see, I'm sure that all his questions should be answered. Anybody can say somebody's bad without knowing anything about him. That doesn't mean anything. 